When you think of Rome, what comes to mind? My friend Jason, he thinks of his son. He, he has a son uh, over there right now studying architecture, and maybe that's what comes to mind, the, the great architecture that's there, the Colosseum and the other pieces of art. Or maybe you're a historian, and so you think this was a dominant empire, the, the cultural effects of which still continue till today. Or maybe the Colosseum, sports. We, sports are not American. Uh, they, they love their sports of, of various kinds back then. So we have uh, uh, our own perspective 2,000 years or however many years later from the Roman Empire. But if you could ask that question to Paul, if you could ask that question to Christians who lived in Rome during the first century, uh, what, what do you think would be some of the things that would have impressed them? And maybe some of the answers would have been similar, but Rome was a city that offered to feed the fleshly, carnal, sinful desires and, and there were Christians in Rome who had once lived that kind of life and were trying to bring their will and their desires into submission to the Lord's, and yet they were surrounded by the opposite mind, seeking to pull them back and to remind them of where they had been and maybe what the things they once enjoyed and still would enjoy if they went back. And so in Romans chapter 13, Paul wrote uh, to help them in the pursuit of submitting themselves to the Lord and submitting their desires to the Lord. And I suppose that Rome probably then was not all that different than, than our society today. If you want to dig and read through some of the people who lived back then, you can find some of the details for yourself. But I believe that we need the same kind of help today uh, that Paul was offering to them, especially in Romans chapter 13. Read with me verses 11 through 14. He says, And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first, began, we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly, as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its desires. We read this morning from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, and gave some thought to that. And this, this is in the same general context. And so be, let your bodies be a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. That, that should be some of the echoes that we hear in the background when we read these verses that we just did. In verses 11 and 12, one of the ways that Paul uh, urges them is he says, look, look at your spiritual calendar, look at your spiritual watch, pay attention to the time. And what he's talking about, what he says, the way he describes that time is, our salvation is nearer than when we, when we first believed. That's the way to... To look ahead is to look back, and since I, every day that has passed since the day that my sins were forgiven by a merciful God, every single day I'm one day closer to the salvation that, that God has, has given and, and then that God will give. And so he says that the day is at hand, and the Holy Spirit here describes our life in the language of, of pre-dawn. I don't know, maybe we're half and half. Who's up? At pre-dawn, I'm, I'm usually not. When uh, we went out moose hunting, two days, I was up about pre-dawn. And you go out, if you're up just before the sun comes up, if you're there just before, then you're ready and you're waiting and you, you can see some, some beautiful things in the skies when the sun comes up. And that's how he describes our lives as Christians, that we're living in the time just before the sun comes out. And every day... The clock is ticking and we're, we're nearer and nearer to the day of salvation. So he begins here by simply exhorting them to, as he says, to, to wake up. Uh, wake out of sleep. The, the alarm clock is going off. In other words, it's time to pay attention because they lived among people who were still asleep. And they themselves had lived in a way that, that, was, that was blind, that was foolish, foolishness. They were sleepwalking through life. And we've all spent some 
some degree of our time there as well. So he says at the the end of verse 12, uh, since in thinking about your life this way, daily bringing you one day closer to the salvation for which we hope, he says, with that then, then cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. How do you cast off the works of darkness? Well, you can't really do that without God's help. If you just try to reform yourself and improve yourself, you can go to the library and go to the self-help section, and you can change a lot of behaviors that are uh, unhealthy or not beneficial to your family. But without God's help, you, you may take off one unbeneficial behavior, but you'll just end up replacing it with something else. You can't put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light without God. You'll just take one form of darkness off and put another form of darkness on. That, that's all that we can do. God created us to, to need His help. And so put those things off, and then with God's help, we can also put on what He calls the, the armor of light. You can't forge, you can't build the armor of light on your own, by your own wisdom, by your own experience, by the, the, the morals of your culture, and even of your raising. That's just not the source for this armor. God is the one who who makes it. God is the one who offers it. But you have to put it on. God is the source, but you have to determine to put it on. And then if you have children, then it's your job to to show them what this armor looks like. And we think about the armor of God of Ephesians chapter 6. And we've got to show them piece by piece with, with our lives by our conduct, and with our words. When we put on the armor, then what what do we earn by putting on the armor? Nothing. You don't don't deserve anything. You don't earn anything. It's it's a military issue armor. You didn't pay to to get it, but God gives it to, to His servants who are willing to put it on. But what do you receive by putting on the armor of light? You... You receive everything. It it meets every need. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, all those things that that Paul illustrates in Ephesians chapter 6. All of that is God's grace to help us put off and then to put on. And so then in verse 13, there he tells us what, what we are to put off. He gives some specific things. And I don't know if these were things particularly notable in Rome. I tend to think these would, these would pretty much be present in, in any society. But he specifies to, to put off revelry and drunkenness. That's what you would have seen if you had been, in, been able to have been in Rome 2,000 years ago. But you don't have to go to Rome. Our society makes the beer and the wine and all of that readily available and has even deceived our society sleep walks through alcohol Well, no, I'm I'm not drunk. I just I'm a little tipsy, but I'm I'm okay. No, you're drunk. Whatever our society says about that, and so drunkenness and revelry that that's here today as it was then. He says, put off off lewdness and lust. I'm reading from the New King James, and as I compared other versions, probably about any other version is better. Uh, Most other versions say to put off sexual immorality and sensuality, and I I think that's a a better translation here. Lewdness and lust really sound like a repetition of of the same concept. Sexual immorality and sensuality would would be two different things. Connected, of course, but two different things. And so you could have seen that back then, and you can certainly see that today. And then, interesting that he ends with strife and envy. Maybe, Maybe we in our own wisdom, might classify that as different. Well, I'd, I'd never go and, and practice sexual immorality or, or drunkenness, but strife and envy uh, connected to pride is what stirs that up. And so that would have been present among people on the streets of Rome. And, and as you read the book of Romans, it was even present among some of the saints there. And so he urges them, walk properly, not in these things. And then verse 14 is sort of the culmination of all of this. He ties it all together. Put those things off, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision 
for the flesh to fulfill its desires. And so what's the opposite of drunkenness and revelry and lewd, sexual immorality and lewdness and envy and strife? He just summarizes the exact opposite of all of that is summarized in the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything He said and everything He did uh, runs contrary to and undermines all of that and trains our eyes and our minds to put those things off. The rest of our study, I want to focus in though just on one part of the warning of verse 13. Among the things that He tells us to make no provision for, no provision for, Uh, Don't leave a a crack in the door open to any of these things. But I want to notice, depending again on your translation, lewdness, the second word in that second pair, sexual immorality and sensuality, or lasciviousness or lewdness, again, just depending on on your translation. Talk about a a definition of that in just a moment, but but really by its context here, and elsewhere, we, we get the basics of the uh, basic idea of what this is. It's something connected to, but not identical to, sexual immorality. Read with me these verses, which, which do just as good a job to define it, and, and also to understand its company. What, what is sensuality? And I'll just say from the outgo tonight, I'm going to try to use as much candor and caution as I can in some of the things uh, that, uh, that we need to talk about on this subject but in these in these verses notice not just that this word sensuality is there but notice what it's always surrounded by second corinthians 12 verse 21 paul says i shall mourn he said he was going to come to them and i shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness fornication and lewdness which they have practiced so just notice its company. Galatians 5.19, among the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lewdness. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 19, speaking of the Gentiles, that they, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. And then one more, 1 Peter 4, verses 3 and 4, very similar to Romans chapter 13 that we read. Peter says, We spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation speaking evil of you. So if... If we were to get a dictionary out, whether an English dictionary or a Bible dictionary, it's not really going to tell us anything that we don't learn by these verses and the company in which lewdness or sensuality is listed. Lewdness is not sexual activity, but is activity related to it that feeds the desires, uh, that increases the thoughts uh, to, to participate in those things. But what I want you to notice is Crossing the line of sensuality is sin. It doesn't mean I've committed the next kind of sin, but it isn't as though, well, that's just getting me close to the line. No, when I participate in sensuality, I've I've crossed one line, and then that's going to get me closer to the next and to the next, which is exactly, of course, Satan's goal. So why why attention to the subject and to the word of sensuality? One reason I wanted us to think about this tonight is is because of the rarity of the word. If if you heard this word on some show you watch, some podcast, uh, uh, the news, if you heard this word in the past week, or any form of it, sensuality or lasciviousness, uh, I suppose not. It's just a word that is rarely used. In fact, I suppose the only reason any of us are familiar with it is just because (laughs) the Bible keeps that word and that concept in, in our mind, but we, we don't hear it around us uh, in order to keep that idea fresh in our mind. Now, it, it's in our dictionaries, of course, but, but that, that's about it. And if you have, if you have heard it, which is unlikely, but possible, I'd say it's 
also even less likely that you heard it used as though it's a negative thing. So if you hear it, it's probably not spoken of as something to avoid and to flee from and to put it off. Now, I, I, don't, know, I don't know how to give a statistic. I, I don't know, nor am I a psychologist. How does that affect us if we, if we don't hear the word? But how prevalent is sensuality on a daily basis? How often do you see and or hear it? I dare say every day that we, we are, it, it comes across our radar, hopefully without our choice, but it, it's, it's present. So what's the influence of that? We see it, but we don't hear it called this word that we read in the Bible that's associated with all of these other things that we heard, uh, that, that we read about a few minutes ago. I don't know the effect of that, but I just know that it means we have to connect the dots. We have to be able to know it when we see it. And when we see it, we've got to put the tag on it, the name tag, that that is sensuality. Because the people presenting it, they're, you know, what are they going to call it? Well, not that. And so this, this is our challenge. What are some modern common activities that are sensual. Again, they're not fornication, they're not adultery, but they're related to it, and they sometimes contribute to the participation in it, but not always. I want to look at, at three, three examples, each of them relatively briefly, but just to help us pin the tail on the donkey. Pornography. Can, can something be a sin if the Word isn't in the Bible? Uh, think about what if we were to say, should Christians put off embezzlement, uh, forgery, and abortion? Can, can we say for sure that those things are sin? Well, we can when we know what embezzlement is. Embezzlement is stealing. So any Bible verse that talks about stealing lets you know embezzlement is a problem. Uh, forgery is lying. And so if I know lying is wrong, then I, it may take me a while to figure out what forgery is, and I may have to look it up. But once I figure it out, well, if I know lying is wrong, I know forgery is, long, is wrong. And of course, abortion is murder. So God does equip us to identify every, every form of error. And Satan may try to hide it and, and relabel it, put, a, put another picture on it. But behind that, inside the can, it's, it, it's the same substance. And so what has God said that would teach us that viewing images, whether it be in a still image or a moving image, what we call a picture or a movie. Uh, what has God said that te would teach us that viewing people who are fully or partially naked is sinful, at least intentionally viewing that? Uh, we, we wouldn't have to go any farther than the passage that we all already read. I'm, in in the, the applications of this, I'm not going to be going to a lot of verses because we can pretty much stay in Romans chapter 11. And that's be one way that we could know that pornography is sensuality. It, it isn't sexual immorality. And it causes some of the same damage to the individual and sometimes their spouse, but it, it isn't the same sin. Pornography has a stranglehold on many people's time. There are people that they miss family activities. They're late to work. They, their life is, is totally off schedule. And this is the reason why. They, they lose track of time because of pornography. There's a stranglehold on many people's finances, on their marriages, and sometimes even, even among Christians, it has a stranglehold on their faith because they, they wrestle with it. They know it's wrong. They feel guilty. They don't do it. They say, I'm not going back to it. But they put themselves back in the same circumstances and they're back, they end up back in the same place. And their, their life is a constant pendulum swing of guilt and remorse and sometimes even genuine repentance, but then they swing back into the same guilt, and it, it's constantly back and forth, and we can only do that for some amount of time, and eventually it's going to be choose whom you will serve. And so part of our responsibility as Christians, we, we have to let God's Word say what it says, and we have to warn against it publicly and privately, at the same time knowing that there are people, again, drowning in it,
We also want them to know that we're willing to help them escape it. And if you need help escape it, escaping it, then get help escaping it. Start with God. But then Proverbs 18 verse 1 tells us that, that, that a fool isolates himself. A fool thinks, well, I, I can just take care of this problem. I don't need anyone's help. It may be embarrassing, humiliating, difficult in a variety of ways. But in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Two is better than one, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Pornography is dangerous. It, if you won't take the time to go through all the statistics, but I've read for years that the, the, finance, the, uh, the, the financial profit of the pornography industry exceeds all the major sports combined exceeds Apple, Google, all the major technology groups combined. It, it's, it's deeper, I hope, than any of us understand. And so we have to take it seriously and warn against it and at the same time have compassion for those whose lives are being ruined because of it. And maybe another lesson for another time, maybe better privately, is, is parents guarding our children uh, because there are people seeking to open the door and make some provision. And I know of people whose lives have been Christians, whose lives have been ruined or made much more difficult because of it from, from a young age. Pornography is sensuality. Secondly, when we think about dancing, and let me start at the beginning by acknowledging dancing is mentioned often in the Bible, usually in the Bible more positively the negatively. So, no, all dancing is not sinful. But, as always, we need to define our words. When you read about dancing in the Bible, it's, it's there in Exodus after the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. And so, part of their rejoicing, it says that the, I think the women had timbrels and, and there was dancing. David, pretty well known for dancing through the street. And he, uh, I think it was after a battle. So, that would be a part of a, of a post-game celebration, so to speak. And so at times we see things like that. But if you want to go through a detailed study of dancing in the Bible, it was, it was always an individual dancing. Or it may have been a group of individuals dancing. But I couldn't find an example of partner dancing in the Bible. And that's because it was primarily, again, a, 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 an occasion of group rejoicing. And so each individual is happy for the same reason. And so it was a dance of joy. That, that's the, the most common example, uh, kind of dancing in Scripture. Is that the most common kind of dancing in our society? It, it happens, it's sure. Again, the, the guy that scored a touchdown, he does his little celebration dance, or uh, the, the, the little league team, they, they win the Little League World Series, and so they may jump around the, the home plate. That, that certainly exists. But... Dancing in our culture, it's the same word, but it's typically something of a different kind, and it might as well have another word attached to it, because dancing in our society is typically a romantic activity, not a rejoicing type activity. And here's one indication of that. It's typically a partner activity, one male and one female. It's typically a romantic activity. That, that's what First, you have, to, you have to recognize, and if you're not sure about that, then study the scriptures and then find some means of surveying the practice in our society. And I think you'll see that dancing in the Bible is different than typical dancing in our society. Uh, after, before you leave tonight, I want to give a handout that goes into some more detail than, than I was going to take time to do tonight. So, some history of dancing in the past in other cultures that gives us a little bit of insight to the most common forms of dancing in our society today. But really what, I, when I, what I'm emphasizing tonight is the typical romantic part of dancing. And that's what makes typical dancing today a sensual activity. Why is it that partner dancing is the most popular kind? Why is it that the kind of dancing that is typical in our society, uh, a young man or an older man would be willing to do with a woman, but not with his buddy? 
not with the his his quarterback or his running back or his wide receiver or he wouldn't put his hand here in his hand and his hand behind him on his back or elsewhere and cheek to cheek and go with the flow of the music and say hey did you see that touchdown yesterday boy that guy made a great catch why because it's practiced in a romantic atmosphere typically lower lighting why a particular kind of music why because it's typically I understand there may be some exceptions but trying to cast a broad net and catch the rule the typical things to help us to see what is now, somebody may see someone's naked body and it's a medical personnel so I understand there's some exceptions to this but let's just hit the rule the rule in our society is dancing is a romantic activity The typical slow dances, think about those, or many ballroom dances that may go faster, but they all have some things in common, and they're designed for similar purposes. And you can, again, you can, I'm not asking you to any time to just take my word for it, but read, pick out some slow dance or some dance you've heard of, of and read. The, of course, these dances are no accident. There's a history to them. There's somebody who developed the steps and the movements and the hold and the music associated with it, what kind of person are they typically? Go and read and find out. And what's their purposes for the turns and the positions and the music that's associated with it? It's a romantic activity the overwhelming majority of the time. It's intended typically to bring, and again, here's, I'll just use the best candor and plainness I can, but dancing is typically intended to bring some of the most intimate parts of the body near to, if not in contact with each other. And is that just because we're all happy? That's not the purpose. It doesn't have to be partner dancing. There can be some individual dances. Our society has perfected that as well. And as our society flings off any standards of of common moral behavior, you can now exercise and express yourself by something called aerial arts. I had never heard of this uh, before moving here, but as we've gone around town to a few family events, there, there are several groups, and it's sometimes called aerial arts. It's usually younger and then different age girls wearing hardly any clothing. What they are wearing is tight, and they're in these, these hoops, and you can just, as an adult, view their positioning, and it's supposed to be an entertainment and something to view. A young girl inside of a hoop, stretching her body in different ways, and here you are, sometimes below, looking up. This, the, the purpose of this is not exercise. And as that continues, there's also something called pole arts, and I will just leave it at that. But they are presented today often as innocent exercises but just as i said we'll read some of the history of of modern dances and again maybe well i'm just doing it for exercise well maybe you can you and your wife can do that for exercise in your home but i can just tell you they were not designed for people who wanted to be athletically fit that's not the primary purpose of the typical partner dance the typical purpose is many of the is the same of the same kind as pornography, what it has in common is sensuality. And Paul warns us, make no provision for the flesh. It, it may not get you to sexual immorality. You may not go that far, but there's a line before that that God has warned us not to cross. And then one more. I, I don't have to tell you, you're not surprised. We and I suppose it would have been the same in Rome, that sensual dress is, is a part of our society and a part of our culture. Go back to the beginning for just a minute. In Genesis chapter 3, God made man and woman and there was no shame associated with their nakedness. But then you remember they sinned and then they made themselves, again, depending on your translation, uh, aprons, some say, I think it's around verse 7. After they sinned, 
and they heard, heard God. They, they knew they were naked, and they made aprons, which is basically a loin a loincloth, or kind of typical if you see a marathon, running shorts. That's, that's about what, what, they, what they made would have covered. And before God sent them out of the garden, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, do you remember what God did? I mean, it's just, it's barely mentioned. Yeah, there's not a lot of description, but just says God made them tunics of skin and He clothed them. Interesting thing is they were wearing some clothes before that. They weren't totally nude. They were partially clothed, therefore partially nude. But it wasn't until verse 21 that God clothed them. And there's a clear contrast between the garment they made for themselves out of leaves and then God makes a tunic or a coat made of skin. There's a, a clear contrast here in the beginning. You say, David, well, but that's the garden. That's the Old Testament. I understand that. Um, I'm not measuring everything by, by that, but I'm just saying this is a man and a woman. We still have man and woman. There's no difference in Old Testament, New Testament, man and woman. And the nature of nakedness hasn't changed from the garden until today. So Genesis 3 verse 21, what I'm just saying it tells us is God is the one who designed clothing, at least clothing that was fitting. And what's the purpose of it there? The purpose is to cover. The purpose is to cover. You knew that. No surprise. But God designed clothing to cover. We need to think mostly, though, about the New Testament in in Revelation chapter 3, verse 18, one of the, to, in one of the rebukes of one of the churches, one of the ways that he describes their spiritual weakness and sickness is he says, you need to put on clothing to cover the shame of your nakedness. Now, their problem wasn't their outward dress. He's using that as a way to figuratively describe them as spiritually unclothed. But here's the point that under the new covenant, the idea of nakedness needing to be covered wasn't lost or forgotten. That was still a reality. When there's a, a figure, when there's an illustration, well, it's, it's only understandable because people understand the literal part. And so even in the New Covenant, it's acknowledged that nakedness is shameful. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. So God intended for clothing to cover... And our society is little by little finding ways to still have some strings attached. But clothing isn't intended to cover. It's intended often, I should say today, to, to uncover, to reveal, to show. And part of the time, what is covered is just intended to get your eyes away from there and get your eyes upon the part that is uncovered. But why, why doesn't our society see it? You seen it, seen it, and closed your eyes, or rolled your eyes, or turned your eyes somewhere else, and you think, how, how could someone wear that? How could a father allow and a mother allow their children to wear that? Well, Ephesians four seventeen through through nineteen tells us why they don't see it. Paul says, "I say this therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind." having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. That's right, they don't get it. They are ignorant. And why would we expect anything different? He says the ignorance is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to, and here we are back to where we started, to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. So why don't they get it? Because they don't want to. Because they've already hardened their heart. They've made excuses and reasoned why it's okay in one situation. So then they, they have to justify it in another situation, in another situation. And so every generation, well, I wore this. I, I guess he can wear that. I didn't wear this. I guess she doesn't have to wear that. The conscience has been hardened over time. So we we shouldn't be surprised, and therefore we have to have our radar up. Who, who is designing the clothes? What kind of people are in charge of the things that are, are on the hangar or on the store? 
Somebody's making the decisions of where the hemline gets cut, high or low, or how the genes are formed, how, how tight or how loose. Somebody's making those decisions. What kind of a person do you think is making those decisions? What do you think their purpose is? So we have to be selective. In verse 20, Paul says, but you have not so learned Christ. In other words, you didn't learn Christ by being ignorant, by having your understanding darkened, by walking in futility, by having a blind heart. You learned Christ by being willing to open your eyes to, to your sin, to, to your weakness, to your foolishness, to repent of it, to leave it. And opening our eyes to our own sin in one way opens our eyes to other weaknesses in other areas. And that, that's a lifelong process for all of us. For all of us. Paul says, you, but that's not the way that you learn Christ. But sometimes even as Christians, our understanding can be darkened. Uh, maybe because of the, the influence of people around us. One, one man said this. I know the author of this, Joshua Gertler. He said this, he said, an older preacher once told me that in India, it'd be wrong for preachers to tell Christian women to cover their midriffs. Likewise, this gospel preacher said, it's wrong to impose our American custom of covering our breasts on topless Christians in Africa. Why do men and women need to wear a shirt? Well, it's just American culture, according to a gospel preacher. So why have some Christians never thought of this? Sometimes because preachers haven't been preaching the word and convincing and rebuking and exhorting with all long suffering and teaching. So when, when does clothing become lewd, become sensual? Well, it, it's when it doesn't cover what God expects for us to cover. When it doesn't cover what God calls nakedness. And again, for the sake of time, I'll... I'm going to hand out that article in which that was said, and you can read a little bit more about that and some other things. But when it doesn't cover what God calls nakedness, uh, whether it's at the public pool or at the beach or on the athletic field or wherever we're in public view, we need to know what God calls naked and let that be shameful and let that draw the line for us. And anything on that other side is sensual and anything on this side is pleasing to the Lord. Our society goes out of its way, literally makes its cuts to promote a provision, to make a provision, to provide an opportunity for the flesh. And then Paul warns us, you put on Christ and make no, no exception, no provision for the flesh to fulfill the desires thereof. Let's finish our study in Proverbs chapter 7. Trust me, this is no more fun to say, <laughs> to talk about, than to hear. But in Proverbs chapter 7, there, there was a father who talked to his son about these things. Proverbs 7, read with me, verses 1 through 5. My son... Keep my words and treasure my commands within you. Keep my commands and live in my law as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call understanding your nearest kin. That they may keep you from the immoral woman. From the seductress who flatters with her words. David and Solomon both wrote the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. They both wrote that. David in Psalm 111, verse 10. Solomon in Proverbs 9 and verse 10. And yet both David and Solomon shared what problem in common? They both made provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. They, they didn't make use of the, the very words that the Holy Spirit gave to them. And so if, if they... If they knew these things well enough for God to use them to record these things, then especially to the men, I might say, but to all of us, read the rest of Proverbs chapter 7. Because the father says to the son, goes into much more detail, but one of the things he says is, Son, I know 
Maybe you, you hadn't thought about this before, but let me tell you, there was a young man who just out of ignorance and naive naivety in some ways, at the wrong time of day, went down the wrong road, down to the wrong house, down the wrong path, and that was the beginning. That was a problem, and his problems went on from there. Read the rest of Proverbs chapter 7, but, uh, and then lead your family in the uncomfortable discussion. But uh, our children have or will see more with their eyes than you did in your youth, more than your parents did at your age, that there is no total escape from it unless we make the mistake of taking literal what Jesus said about plucking your eyes out, but then you would hear it. And so we need these warnings, but I, I suppose Proverbs chapter 7 could, could be summarized where we started in Romans chapter 13 to put, on, put, off, uh, put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Are things worse than they used to be? could show you statistics or surveys about people's view, about pornography, about dancing, about drinking, about clothing, about revelry. We, we could do that. Is it getting worse? Probably. But has it always been bad? It's always been bad. Was there ever a time when the things that we've talked about tonight were not a problem? They've always been a problem. And maybe our society for a time had a few more safety guards and a little more what we might think was common sense. But it doesn't matter. The, the same problems and temptations were present then. And uh, I pray for and trust God's help to have wisdom uh, to, to, to put these things off and put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Jesus said, I, I am the door. Open your songbooks to number 297. The only way that you can escape these things. Oh, there, there can be people go through their life, be a good neighbor and never view a second of pornography, but they, they can't escape their sin, their other sins, without going through the door. And so Jesus came to this earth to, to live and to die and to rise from the dead so that whatever our sins are, there would be a way of justly forgiving us. If you need God's forgiveness because you're not a Christian, then we sing this song to urge you to think about eternity and the day of judgment and the grace that's available tonight to you. If believing that Jesus is the Christ, you're ready to repent of your sins and confess that faith and be buried with Christ, where by faith in the working of God, you'll, you'll be made new. If as a Christian, privately, you have made provisions then make no more provisions and seek forgiveness. And if, if our help will serve you in some way, tell us how as we stand and sing.